Hey guys, Henning and Morten from Flip Normals here. And in today's video, we're gonna go through the workflow for creating this character start to finish. Uh, we're gonna go through all the various steps using uh, Blender, ZBrush and Substance Painter and how you can go from sculpting the character, texture painting him and going into Blender for the final render. Now, before we get into the actual practical video, we highly recommend that you check out our latest masterclass called Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass, where we do go through in real time how to create this character start to finish. The masterclass is over 21 hours long and really shows you everything from the first brushstroke to creating all the textures in Painter, with topology in Blender, to the final lighting and rendering in Blender with some post work in Photoshop. So if you are interested in that, I highly recommend that you check out that masterclass. So starting off the workflow part of this video, the first step when I create any character is that I start off in either Blender or Maya or any other software I'm using. And I'm starting off with something very simple like this, at least when I'm sculpting something from scratch, something more creative. And as you can see, this is just a box with some extrusions and just like even topology like this. And the reason for this is just that now we have established the position of the character in terms of where he is in space, the scale and also the orientation. So if we were to go into the front view now, you know that he is indeed facing the front, which is really important. This is a step that's easy to miss because you just want to get into the sculpting, but now suddenly the scale and orientation is all off. This is something that you see often if you, for example, start with a sphere in ZBrush. Uh, sculpting wise, then you're going to have to adjust this later on. So doing this just saves you some time. So jumping into ZBrush, we've now turned our little sphere into a pretty rough sculpt. This is really like the first step of the sculpting. And whenever I'm sculpting, I'm focusing on two parts of the character. The first one is the anatomy. You have to make sure the anatomy is at least in a decent stage before you proceed. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Not every single bone and muscle has to be in it, but it will have to feel like it's a credible uh, sculpt, like it actually belongs in this world. And that's what we're focusing on now. We are, of course, thinking about the overall characteristics of the character as well in terms of his general proportions and, and all that. Uh, and we are also using, you know, in the full masterclass, we're using image planes. Uh, and I'm very much lining things up to image planes at this point, but still mostly focusing on the overall anatomy. And then we are moving on to the design phase. Now, once the anatomy is working, then you have to really make sure that the design is on point. I find it helpful to separate it into the, the two phases, into anatomy and design, because it means that it's easier to troubleshoot what's going on. If something isn't working in your sculpt, you can now go in and, and think about the different, different stages. Anatomy, okay, cool. Are the bones in the right spot? If yes, are the muscles in the right spot? If yes, are is the fat and the muscles and the, are those in the right spot? And you can just troubleshoot those. And if all of those are in a fairly decent stage, then you can go in and you can focus on the uh, design, where which means that uh, are the shapes nice and clean? Is the surface solid? Is the silhouette appealing? Are you deliberate about the shapes being straight to curves. All these kind of things are really useful uh, when it comes to that. And that's what we're focusing on at this stage, really just making sure the design is working. You see the difference between these two. This feels more like just a dude uh, where, you know, it's still some design, but here he feels more like the final character. We're then moving on to just refining the design as well, where we are getting in more of his personality, getting his thin lips, getting more in, getting in the eyes, and getting in like a lot of the indication of the mid frequency, and also we're getting in the horns as well. It's really important when you're designing anything that you get to a, I would say like 30, 40% mark pretty early on, where you, you get all elements in there. You don't want the head to be perfect, all the pores and all the mid frequency, while you're missing important details like, uh, like the horns, or you know, if you had a body, you would need to get everything in there, like the ears as well. A big mistake is to forget these kind of things, and the reason is you can't, you really can't evaluate the design until you have everything there. I think it's important to note as well that the very first stage, the sort of rough blocking anatomy stage, is where. A lot of the character, you know, what going, what's going forward is going to come from. That's where we sort of figure out the proportions and, and where everything should go. All the refinement stages, 
you know, visually they start to, it starts to look like less and less happens because so much of it is inferred from the very, very first stage. So it's important to take your time um, at that very first, first stage. It's really interesting with that actually, because the difference between this stage and this stage, there, there might be like two to three hours of sculpting, but you can't see it that much. Obviously the character looks <laughs> better, but there are just diminishing returns along, along the way. Yeah, and, and especially some of the later stages as well, right? Where maybe you'll spend five hours doing just a lot of wrinkles and pores. And, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, you might not even be able to tell exactly what happened, but it, it really just completes the character. Yeah, you can feel them. What's important at this stage as well is, you know, now we've gone through all the various stages. This At this stage, the character design is resolved it's not a done character at all but in terms of design everything is where it's supposed to be you know the ears are shaped in a proper way the horns are where it's supposed to be the silhouette is not going to change at this point and this is really important because after this stage we are starting our retopology and whenever you do retopology you do not want to design anything retopology is purely a technical stage where you are just basically remeshing whatever is here so that you, it's more animation friendly you sh really should not design anything so at this stage i'm very careful about the mesh being in a good spot like you can see here uh, the the um ears are not just like potato ears like you know they're they're properly going into it it's very easy to go in and just making sure that this here is just it's just like one shape like this but that's going to really cause issues because once you get into the subsurface part and and the lighting and shading all that this is going to not respond as it should meaning already at this stage we've kind of started taking shading into account how you model becomes very important later on when it comes to shading so before you retopologize the model just needs to be in a, in a good spot Though that said, it shouldn't be in a final spot. Like you shouldn't have all the pores and wrinkles and everything because we are going to reproject this onto the retopologized version and some areas are going to mess up. So just be aware of that. It's mostly going to be the bigger shapes that really, you know, especially from this distance, um, create variation in the surface. Something like pores it's like that's micro detail, right? It, it helps bring the realism into the character, but it doesn't actually really deform the surface to the same extent that wrinkles do. So once we have our sculpt to the level where all the shapes are in there, we're gonna to start to retopologize our character. This is done entirely without any any add-ons or anything like that, though I do recommend add-ons like Retopo Flow, just, just anything that speeds up retopology. One of the issues with Blender is you can see that it becomes a bit hard to see what's on the back, and there isn't really a good way of doing that without add-ons, but honestly, for retopologizing ahead, Vanilla Blender is perfectly fine. That's also what we're doing in the Masterclass. We're not using any add-ons for this whatsoever. My philosophy when it comes to retopologizing is work from general to specific this is the same thing as when it comes to sculpting as well this i think this is really important because it's really easy to just go into like the eye and just finish up the eye and finish up the nose and finish up the mouth and then you then you try to connect things up here you can see that we already thinking about how things connect up like here you can see this connects here and this connects here and you can connect these kind of things up and it's not that hard to to do that it just means that it's if you have good loops in the right spots connecting things up is honestly quite simple and this is how we get started we start basically just with like a single polygon and we just extrude this around across the surface and uh, using shrink wrap and mirroring as well so you can really just see the whole character at the same time though shrink wrap is enabled or the uh, mirror is, is disabled in the edit mode so you, you won't get confused by that so this is a fantastic way of working you just block it out one area at a time and then you can start to connect it up you're really going to be doing yourself a favor by keeping it simple for as long as possible. Well, not as long as possible, but until you've mapped out the entire face. It, it goes for anything, really, if it's a full character, a body, or a face. If you start out super complicated, uh, solving the puzzle that is read topology, because it is a puzzle, is so much harder, uh, especially later down the line when you try to get everything to, to fit together nicely. You know, resolution comes from subdivision. You can always subdivide your mesh once you have the general loops in there. 
you can see just here how quick it is to actually just block things out once you have a good foundation for it. And then we are continuing our retopology journey where we are just adding more loops. We're continuing kind of what we what I just did now where we're just bridging things together and just trying to get coverage over the whole thing. This is really important, it, it, but it is like, like more saying, it, it is a puzzle, which means that you can see for instance up here, we, we definitely have end guns at this point. We can't have end guns at the end, and this is not due to some kind of like philosophical reason. It's just that ZBrush flat or rejects end guns. It's going to convert it to triangles. But what you can see is like it means that we we know how to solve this area, but we don't we don't necessarily know how to solve the back of this. So in that case, we're just kind of making some end guns here. And the cool thing is, once you have one end gun, it becomes easier to or once you have two end guns, it becomes easier to connect them up. So this is the stage, uh, or this is the retopology at this stage. And then we are going in and just finalizing it. There's nothing magical happening between these steps. We're just going through and just adding more resolution to it, making sure everything is nice and even, obviously fixing end guns, which are up here as well. And also in this case, it's kind of a cool pattern. You can see this, that if you want to, um, if you want to simplify something, you can very easily do that by, instead of all these going all the way down, they're just going down here, going like so, and then this is the pattern you're seeing. And you're seeing this over and over and over again. This is a really effective pattern for uh, reducing the, the poly count. So we are just going over and just doing all of the areas. We have a whole chapter dedicated in the monster class to the ears as well, because my God, ears are some tricky little guys to get right. It's just a, it's just a hard area to do, just due to how thin area everything is and how small everything is. And you can see something you often have to do with the ears is you'll have to terminate loops, maybe inside the ear canal or behind the ear, just to make sure that the resolution actually matches up with the rest of the head because we don't usually have that much resolution for the head. The back of the inside the ears, this is what I refer to where polygons go to die because you're really not going to see any of this in, in the final one and it's really not going to do a whole lot. So yeah, I use this. You can even see a triangle here as well where well, actually a full triangle. <laughs> so we're just trying to avoid areas like this like areas like this they should be really nice and, and clean and areas like this they, they they can use you can use nasty geometry here so yeah this is uh these are the horns done as well this is done just with a um a simple cylinder and just shrink wrap to this as well and then we are jumping back into zbrush again and this is where we now have a model which has all the nice topology and uh, it's just a properly done model. And then we have the old model as well. And what you can see here is I projected this guy onto this guy. So they look the same, but under the hood, they're not. They look almost the same. There's a little bit of changes here and there, but in general, it's pretty much the same. Uh, while we were sculpting as well, we did a zero meshing pass on the model. This just means we have auto topology over the whole thing. Now, this looks cool, but it's not functional topology in terms of deformation. You can see here around the mouth as well. It doesn't really, it doesn't really wrap around it. The eyes are really problematic. And this is where retopology is a fantastic tool because now we can go into the retopologized version, go all the way to the bottom, and now you can see how much nicer this actually looks. So this is where, a little tip as well, hit Control w just to create a whole polygroup. This is where you can see that this just wraps around the whole thing. And by reprojecting re it, you can now really just get the best of both worlds. You get the shape from the old one, get all the nice little details, all the mid-frequency, but with the topology of the new one. A little tip as well, this is something that they introduced fairly recently in ZBrush. This is called History Project. So if you go under Subtools, then you go to project. There's a little guy here called history project. And in, in, in short, the way it works, you just go up into the old one, you control click on the timeline up here, weird Seabird UX, I know, and then you have history project. And now you can just do that. And this just projects from the exact same point here onto this one. And this, I find this, this projection type to be better than the traditional projection type. Just a little tip for you there. What you also notice is that the UVs are not done at this stage. So we did our retopology, then we reprojected it, and the UVs are not done. Uh, we're doing that after reprojection. You know, you don't have to, but I prefer to do it afterwards because now it means that the UVs are going to match perfectly with the actual mesh. Whenever you reproject something, you might have some stretching of polygons and some re-sculpting of certain areas. And by doing the UVs afterwards, you ensure that if there is stretching in those areas, you're not going to get UV stretching. This will just, um, the model will just be the same as the, um, as the UVs. 
And with that said, we are going to jump into Blender and I'll show you the overall UVs. So here are the final UVs we have in Blender. The method for this is very simple, honestly. The the UV tools in Blender are pretty lacking, in my opinion. And the way I'm using the Blender for UVs is I'm selecting seams using just you know seam selection, like selecting an edge here, and then just selecting a uh, selecting a seam, like just mark seam. I have this in my quick favorites, and then I'm just exporting this as an OBJ into ZBrush. Uh, then we're using UV Master in ZBrush. UV Master is fantastic because it gives you really nice and symmetrical UVs, but also it just unfolds in a beautiful way. You might have to go a bit back and forth though between the two software just to really figure out the exact seam placement. And the advantage of this is you can really see we get nice and clean UVs this way. I really did. I really do wish that the UVs in Blender were uh, were better or the UV tools were better. Uh, the unfolding is just unfortunately lacking, but with the trusted UV master in ZBrush, we, we can really get nice and clean UVs in Blender nevertheless. And what you can see here as well is we're using UDIMs. So we have four UDIMs in total. And this just means that each one of these UDIMs is one texture map. If you, if you want to have more resolution on your model, you really, or in textures, you really have to split the model out into units like this, because otherwise you're gonna have to just make this whole thing like 16K or 32K and just keep uppressing that, and that's just not viable. So just blocking it out like this, where this is one texture map, this is one texture map, this is just a great way of working, both in terms of performance in, in like Painter and Blender, but also in terms of like how you can get fine, like nice fine resolution. I mean, it's like just a few years ago, the whole UDIM thing was, it was something pretty much, I mean, we used it on film a lot. Uh, the tools weren't really there for all software, but nowadays everything is just updated and, and optimized for UDIM. So really there's no reason not to use it. it. It makes your models and your textures a lot easier to work with. And then once our UVs are done, we are importing these into ZBrush uh, again. And now we are just putting on some headphones and just sculpting. This is where you just have to just refine the model. You can see here how much nicer the forehead is, how much nicer the horns are, and overall how much more refinement there is in certain areas, like if you look at below the mouth as well. This just takes time. And this is just labor. And this is where having spent proper time on the concept sculpting earlier, that's really going to pay off. And also having done nice topologies and UVs as well is also really going to help us. And then it's time for the final refinement of the model. This is where we're going in and just adding pores everywhere. We're using uh, the Flipmobile's face kit for this, where you have a lot of really cool face alphas. There are two products. Is you have the, the skin kit, which is great for general skin. And then we have the face kit for specific face textures like this. So we're just going in and just really just plastering this all over the place. This is actually just 15 million polys, what you're seeing on the screen now, and it's quite detailed. The full one is 64 million polygons, though we're not going to show that due to Seabridge going a little bit crazy and with video recording at the same time. So this just means that we can now get really in uh, like really detailed in Seabridge when it comes to all the pores and the skin breakup and all that. Now, a quick discussion regarding should you do this in ZBrush or in texturing like Mari or Painter. It, it's, it's really up to you, pros and cons. The advantage of doing this in ZBrush is it's very direct. You can just plaster this all over the model and uh, you, can, uh, you can interact with it directly. You can integrate nicely with the frequencies already there and it will look really good at the end. The disadvantage is obviously that you need a crap ton of polygons, performance goes crazy, and you really can't add more resolution than this. Like you can't go one, one subdiv higher than this because then you're at really like danger zone territory. The advantage of doing this in Painter is that it's much more procedural. You can change the model up and the, the textures aren't really changing. So you, you, it's more production friendly to do this in Painter. But here we just thought it was a cool idea to do this directly in ZBrush because you really do control everything. Yeah, the ZBrush method is destructive, but by no means any worse. Where you can run into trouble though, is if you already have an insanely uh, high res model where it just isn't feasible to add more resolution, you're, you're forced to, to do it in, in textures instead of, you know, doing it directly on the model. 
Yeah, if you were to go this close up on a model, which you definitely have in certain films, uh, this is just not viable because you have to split it up an infinite amount of times, which just would be impossible to do. You can also do a bit of both as well. You can do you can take it to this level, and then you know if you want even more of a frequency, then you can do this with procedurals in something like Painter or Mari. And speaking of Painter, we are now jumping into the texturing part. This is where we are just methodically building up the color map step by step. I'm just going to disable the symmetry line here, or really symmetry in general. And here you can just see how we're starting out. In the whole course and my workflow in general, I prefer to hand paint as much as possible. You can, of course, project things on top as well. But by hand painting, you control it fully. You can, of course, do a mix as well, where maybe you start off hand painting and then you do, you do uh, projections on top. But in this case, it's fully hand painted. And really how it works is it's quite simple. We have a base color or just a base fill layer. And in this one, it just has a, has a color like here. And it's only only has the color slot as well, the only color channel. And you can change this up as much as you want to. This is a real advantage of this. So this method is very non-destructive. And then we're making a layer called red. It's called red because it has red color in it. And this is where we're just straight up just painting in the, the details here. So it was going to look like this if we look at the actual mask. And in the mask, there's just a simple paint layer as well. So very nice and simple. We're just using some of the, the brushes that ships with painter, like some of the dust brushes and dirt brushes. And um, there was one called Dots Erased as well, which is fantastic. I really use this for this. And this is great just for, for getting some quick color variation and some quick breakup in certain areas. And this is everything you're seeing now is just one layer. So you can get a lot of variation in using just this. And then we're going to keep working on our color map. And if we just expand our layer palette here, you can see that we have a lot more layers. And let's just go through some of these. So we, we have a, uh, the same layer as before, just a bit more refined. And then we're just going to be adding a few more colors to this. This is where I prefer to add a bit more yellow, well, not just a bit more, actually adding yellow, adding a bit of blue to it. You can see the variation here. I know one called redder, it's called redder because it's, well, the same, just a bit more saturated as before. And this allows me to just really just get in here and break up the skin and get some more like slightly rosy cheeks and a bit more red around his ears as well. So this one becomes very important. And then we're just going in and, and playing a bit with values as well really just going in and like like almost adding fake ambient occlusion. You want to be careful with that. You don't want to be careful with ambient occlusion in general and curvature maps and all that. And the reason is because it's not it's not really necessarily there in like in the character. Ambient occlusion isn't a real thing. It's just stuff that's closer together gets darker and that's not necessarily something we want in our character. So up until this point, we, we've hand painted everything. And honestly, this just takes a few hours. This is not just like a quick process. You just bash out some stuff. You have to be methodical about this. But up to this point, it's all hand painted. And now we're going to introduce procedurals. And procedurals are insanely powerful. They allow you to get a lot of variation really quickly. But like with sculpting, you need a proper foundation beforehand, a foundation when it comes to color variation, value variation, and just understanding what uh, certain areas should look like. I'm just adding some more procedurals on top of this as well. And then finally, we're adding, introducing our displacement map. The advantage of that is that we get a lot more details into our color map. Now, I, I just refer to it as color map. This is just an old NPC habit I have, but you can call this base color or albedo, whatever you want to. The point is, this is just a map that contains only the color. It does not contain lighting or shadow whatsoever. And that is a bit of a problem because what we've done now is we've introduced, now this is, you know, just 1K, it's 4K in the final one, but we've introduced a lot of, um, of little pores and it looks like dirt in the model, which we don't want. We want a lot of this to come from the shader itself. So we have to balance all this out. But even so, it's still a good idea to introduce this into it because it, you, you are allowing the, um, uh, the textures to get a lot more variation like this. And here is um, our final painter scene with all the maps done. Now you can see that everything is a lot more balanced. And also we have two additional maps. We have scattering and we have the roughness map. So just let's just have a look at the base color first. So everything is more balanced. You can still see traces of the displacement map. Uh, you know, you can see, see a little bit of this and we can also see a bit more color variation and everything is just more refined. And this just takes time. What we've also done in the meantime is we've introduced some pimples in ZBrush as well. At this point, everything goes a little bit off the rails where uh, you're not just painting a texture map and this goes into the shader and your 
your your sculpt and texture maps they're two different entities now you'll sculpt a little bit more and then you'll introduce this back in so actually these pimples here they were sculpted in uh, zbrush and then i painted a quick uh, mask in zbrush and i brought this mask into into painter just so these will be in the exact same spot and you can see how much more variation you get just from this if you just were to disable this and then enable this again all right so now the, the pimples are off and you can just see the how how much cleaner everything looks and the moment we enable this again then uh, how much more variation there is a little tip as well is you generally have to be more extreme with your or your color map in terms of contrast and details and everything because the moment you put this into into paint into blender or arnold wherever you're rendering then everything becomes more washed out and this is because you have uh, specularity on top you have soft lighting you have shadows it's just hard to see what's going on really and also the uh, the subsurface is also gonna gonna soften off certain things so this is really the, the final texture map for the color. So let's have a look at the additional maps as well, which is roughness. And what a roughness map looks like is might be very different from what you assume a roughness map, lo map looks like. And the reason for this is that we've spent a lot of time sculpting up our character. And you don't want to do your roughness map until this is in a proper good spot, until you have all the pores and everything. Because the the roughness or the smooth value of a certain area is so dependent on the actual the actual model. So in this case, you can see that the uh, nasolabial fold is stupidly smooth. It's, always, it's really, really, really uh, smooth in terms of the roughness. But that's fine. It's because we've got feedback from the render at this point. You know, do go a, bit, a little bit back and forth. And we just saw that you can barely see any any shininess on these areas. And then you just have to crank it down. And that's because there's a lot of there was a lot of breakup in this area when it comes to the sculpt. So this is made in a very simple way. Like the whole roughness map is made in a very simple way. We addressed that quite a lot in the masterclass actually. And this is where we just have uh, smart masks where we're just starting off before we do anything in terms of uh, texture. We're just starting off with uh, smart masks just so we can very quickly just create these areas that we know we're gonna use over and over again. So we can use this for general color grading or for uh, roughness maps or scattering maps and such so it just means we can very quickly just go in and create a map or a, a, an area in the roughness map just by using a fill layer and just dragging in a smart mask so it's really important that you preview your uh, your roughness map in the viewport like this but also in the render you truly don't know what your roughness map looks like or what it should be like until you see this in a final render and iray does not count you need an actual render where you have all your displacement map and all your bumps combined unless of course you set up iray to work properly but in this case we we are we haven't set up a proper displacement map or bump map in painter then we have the scattering map as well and let me just get to that the scattering map is is using the exact same method as the roughness we actually just straight up just duplicated the uh, the roughness um, group and just rebalanced it so where you can see like certain areas we just have, we have a scattering channel here and we can just move this kind of stuff up and down if we just let this run for a little bit so now you can just see that we can just change the amount real quick and my philosophy when I'm doing this is skin is going to absorb quite a lot of, of light and uh, bony areas are going to absorb less light and also of course you just have to arc correct this based on feedback from the render so it's really important to have some kind of map like this but just don't do, go too crazy with it you can see how simple this is the same thing with the roughness as well like how simple this actually is and you can see a little bit of um, the um, of the displacement map has been introduced as well just to make it pop just a little bit and then once all the maps are done we're going to be exporting these out from painter and we're going to bring them back into blender now it is just important to address the fact that in, in this video, we are showing this as more as a linear process, but this truly is not linear when you're working. You have to bring rough, uh, like pretty, pretty simple color maps and roughness maps and such into Blender just to test them out because you don't know what something looks like until you see it in the shot. If you're just working in a Painter like this, and you're just reviewing the color map and the reference map, you're working in the blind, at least somehow blind. So you need to export this into Blender. So once we have all our um, maps made in Painter or Mari, wherever you create them, it's now time to bring this into a, a proper render engine. And in this case, we're, we're using cycles. You can use 
any other engine. I my personal is actually my personal favorite is actually Arnold. I really like working with Arnold, but Cycles is also fantastic. And what we're doing is we're just using a principled uh, BSDF for the skin shading, and we are using a few different settings here. I'm just going to cover real quick how this is working. We have the the base color. This is the color map from uh, from Painter that you can see here. Just one UDIM. You obviously have the additional UDIMs over here, and this is just what it looks like. The final export map, and this goes into the subsurface color. This is important, and you have to enable subsurface to one. Uh, this, the way this works is that if um, subsurface is set to 50%, then it's going to be blending between the, the base color and uh, subsurface. But we just want 100% subsurface to control this, which means we don't have to worry about like if you've been working with old skin shaders, like epidermal maps, subdermal maps and all that. We just straight up plug the color into the subsurface color, enable subsurface one. And now this is where it gets interesting, because if you want to have the color here be like nice and orangey and red. This is actually controlled using the subsurface radius. If we just disable this, you can see that by default, it's going to be set to just some like, well, not even arbitrary numbers, but from our point of view, this doesn't actually make sense. Like one, zero, two, zero, one. This is not artistic in any sense. So we don't actually know what we're doing if we just, if we just uh, work with those numbers. So instead, what I'm using, I'm using a mixed node and I'm just plugging this into the subsurface radius. And this is what it's going to look like if this is set up this way. But if we were to change the color now to something like, let's just do a bright cyan or something like that. Now you're going to see that this actually looks nice and cyan, which means the subsurface radius is really what's controlling the, um, the, the level of scattering. So if we were to take this lower, like remove all saturation and just set this all the way down to zero, now there's not going to be any scattering at all. So now you can see no scattering whatsoever. And it's really fast to render because scattering takes up a lot of time. It also introduces a little noise into your character. And if we set this guy all the way to one, you can see a lot of scattering. But this isn't just a an axis or a value between bright and dark. It's a value or it's a it's something where you can introduce color as well. So now, for instance, first you want to change uh, you want to change this to the overall value you want. And this is the amount of subsurface you want in your character. But then you will introduce color as well. And this, of course, depends on what kind of character you do. But in general, I find that some, somewhere between like red and orange is really nice. And now you can see, boom, we have nice subsurface in the ears. And overall, he's just going to feel like a nice organic character. Personally, for me, the subsurface radius has always been a mystery. This takes that away completely you know now you just focus on a few values or just the value and then add whatever subsurface color you want and you're kind of done yes skin shading used to be incredibly complicated but once i understood how to make it simple like this we can really make the whole skin look good just with a few simple nodes as well uh, a little tip as well if you hit uh, control shift and click you can now see maybe you have to go to the look the viewport you can now see the texture map on top of your uh, of your render, which is super useful because now you can just see exactly what's going on. You can see the exact color like this. This is especially helpful if you know you're working with any kind of color data, any kind of color data, and you have a a node afterwards. For example, the map range. You know you can preview the map range, and then you can directly see what your changes, the changes in values, what they really do to to your maps. Yeah, for me, the control shift click is, is an absolute essential way of working. And once you're done with it, you just uh, preview the material output or just the material. And then you can see it here as well. Something also briefly I have to talk about is uh, color space and LUTs. We're not going to go in depth in this at all. But by default in Blender, you're going to be having a, um, a LUT called or view transform here called Filmic. And Filmic is great in a sense that it's really good at distributing your values nicely. So if you have some areas that are really hot, it's going to just like taper those off and your values are going to be nice and balanced. The problem is that I find Filmic being way too extreme. It... Um, it really does too much damage to your work and uh, the colors are really just disappearing. So instead of that, we are using a view transform called AGX, which is fantastic. This just balances out the render really, really nicely. So if we could just go between like uh, view transform AGX to native, this is, this is what it looks like before. And 
this just looks unbalanced and the highlights are too hot and the darks are too dark. And if we go into AGX, everything just balances really, really nicely. So this is what we're using in this um, in this whole course. And you can find a link where you can download AGX in uh, the video description as well. Or you can just straight up Google AGX and there's going to be a link to the author's GitHub. And then you can just install that. Really, really useful. These two things, working with uh, like plugging the base color into the subsurface and using a color for the radius along with AGX, this is like as close as you can get to like a one weird trick for skin shading because skin shading is tricky and getting nicely balanced renders is really, really hard. So these two little things, they're going to really make your art look so much nicer. And then we are updating our texture maps between these various videos, uh, changing the lighting just a little bit. And we're also adding eyes to the character. This is really important. I find making eyes to be an insanely time consuming and complicated part of character of the character process. So instead we are we made a product called the Flip Normals Eye Kit, which means you can just drag and drop your eyes straight into the character and it's gonna work in around like 30 seconds. It is literally just import get the eyes in here and then just place them where they're supposed to be. So that's what we're, that's what we're using for uh, for this course. And it just makes it so much easier. Uh, we're also using the new hair tools found in Blender 3.3, along with some geometry nodes as well, just to do the overall groom for the character. It's really important to add hair to the character. People tend to miss this out and you're just missing a whole dimension of the character. So we have a little bit of hair in his ears, we have the eyebrows, and we have a little bit of nose here as well. Very subtle, but these kind of little things, they do matter. Of course, at this point, we don't have uh, a proper material for the um, for the uh, the hair. And uh, in general, we're at a stage now where I find this stuff gets uglier. <laughs> like we have a pretty nice render before, like in the last scene we looked at, and now I find it actually look, looking a bit worse. But this is where you just have to balance the lights. You just have to pose your character a little bit and uh, just update the general areas, which uh, makes him look a little bit uh, dirty at this point. I think it's always like the closer you get to, or you try to get to realism, the harder it actually gets. You know, if you just stop at the clay sculpting phase, you just have a gray shader on there. Most decent sculpts will look fantastic from that point on. But then you start with the shaders and everything, and then you basically have to do all of the look dev and everything to make sure that your amazing sculpt will also look great with textures and shading and, and everything else. Yeah, I found it to be a really important point because when you're just having dealing with a sculpt, then you're not really in the uncanny valley. People just look at it and be like, yeah, that's a pretty cool sculpt. But if you're at this point, you're dealing with a oh, man, he looks creepy. <laughs> the eyes are in a weird position and, and his the hair is weird and everything. But so it's you'd really just have to spend a lot of time going away from that. So here's a little tip as well, actually using the, the eye kit. You can just um, select the controller, then hit double double tap the R key, and now you can just really easily just like um, rotate it around like so. So this is what we're doing in actually the next chapter. And then we are in our final render scene. And you can see how much more refined everything looks at this point. You know, we spent more time on the textures. There was actually about 40 minutes of sculpting on the forehead between these chapters. You can also see that we got in and we added some little veins here as well. And uh, we just got in and refined the whole thing. We tried to make the lighting a bit more appealing as well, trying to get a little bit of rim lighting here, tiny bit of depth of field as well. I'm not even sure if you can see this uh, due to compression, but overall this, it just looks much more refined at this point. We really are at a stage where everything has been going off the rails for a while, where you're not just improving the sculpt and then the textures and then your render and your lighting render. You, you just do a little bit of work on the lips and then you work a little bit on the sculpt getting in the veins and then you work a little bit on horns and everything just gradually becomes better. There isn't one stage where it just looks better. Between the last chapter and this one, there's quite a lot of hours to be honest just in refining the tiny little things. But just some specific things though, like just like just what we briefly did just a second ago was just like going in and just rotating the eyes a little bit. That kind of stuff matters a whole lot. Just try, really trying to make him feel in a specific way. So it's like his face is facing one way and then his eyes are facing another way. It's like the cheapest and quickest trick in the book, but it works quite well. 
and just finding a nice camera angle as well. It, it takes a long time to find a simple setup. In this case, we really just have two lights. We have two lights and we have an HDRI as well. Like it's really, really simple. Just two area lights and a gen fairly generic looking HDRI just from like, I think, I, I can't remember what the new site is called, but it used to be HDRI Haven. I think it's just called Polyhaven actually, where you can just find tons of free HDRIs. And um, then you just render this out, like just real quick on render settings and such. Like here, I just made the, the resolution high. The specific setting of this, it's not that important. I just made it 3000 by 2400. And in terms of samples as well, I just set this to two and a half thousand. I find that whenever I'm doing characters like this, it doesn't matter. The, like you shouldn't spend too much time just balancing it perfectly. If you're doing animation, that's a different thing. But for a still render like this, just set them so that you're not going to get any noise. Uh, go for a walk, make dinner, do something else. Otherwise, you're going to be spending more time optimizing the render than you are actually going to be spending on rendering the character. This whole thing, I think, took around half an hour to render or something like that. You know, this is using GPU rendering, so it's quite fast. But if you were to spend like two hours trying to optimize the render, then you could have just set this to two and a half thousand and not have any noise. Something that I would uh, encourage people to play around with as well, even for final renders, uh, is the denoiser. I use denoising for pretty much all of my renders now, uh, even with animation. And honestly, for the last, for the last, last many releases, I haven't really been able to tell that I'm using a denoiser. So definitely give that a go. Yeah, the denoiser is fantastic when it comes to uh, uh, to just reduce the render time. You can have a much lower sample than this and you can render out. Though just a little note on the denoiser, we actually aren't using denoiser for this course. Uh, and the reason is just because there's so many there's so many textures, so many tiny little things in the texture. So I just want to make sure that's that's properly done. But uh, you know, in general, add a denoiser and just find a find a nice balance between the samples. That's gonna work really well. And then once we've rendered out the whole thing, you can see here that it is, it's really a nice clean render. It's a little bit of noise down here, but that just looks like almost like film grain. So we have this whole render and this is just brought into Photoshop just straight up as a PNG. Like don't tell my rendering friends that and the guys who work in comp, they're gonna throw pens at me or something. But for this general workflow, this works really well. Like this is more like a, almost like a digital painting workflow or a photographic workflow. You just bring stuff into, into Photoshop and you just abuse the render. You just throw all sorts of crap at it. We're not working like a perfect 16-bit half float EXR workflow, but the advantage of this workflow is that you can really go in and paint highly specific things. So this workflow works really well. So we're just adding a, uh, a background and make sure this background is not black. It looks kind of black, but it's not. The reason for that is that very few things are truly black and it looks weird if things are truly black. So we're just going in and just adding a bit of um, tiny bit of value to this and then just adding a tiny bit of like a little little uh, gray in the back. Like this is like the simplest thing in the world it just looks like this. It's just like a painted soft thing just to have a little bit more of a focus there, blending it in a little bit. And then we have two general tasks we're doing. The first one is a global color correction. And this is where we're just going in and just changing overall how it looks. So we're just going in with some brightness contrast. Every single render you've ever done from any software will need some brightness contrast. It probably needs to get a little bit brighter and it probably needs a little bit more contrast. So you can just see it's it's subtle, but it just, just makes it pop just a little bit. And then we have, this is kind of a little weird little trick, but use a black and white layer and set it to soft light or overlay and change the opacity down. This is just going to make it a bit more high contrast and a bit more desaturated. Then we have a vibrance, very subtle. Color lookup, this is pretty cool. This is where we can use uh, an overall like 3D LUT just to get like go through here and really just change the look. You can very, very quickly change the look for this. If you're on PC, you can just go through and just go through the arrow keys here. On Mac, you have to click them, which is annoying. But on PC, you can just go through it like so. So just see if I can do all this. <laughs> there we go, cool. And then we can just go through and just add a few more colored lookups. This is great for experimenting and just going out of your comfort zone. So we're just going through a lot of these and just layering them up. And you can see how different the final thing looks here while the overall global color correction looks. And it's almost like if you're looking back at this one, you're like, huh, that's what it used to look like.
And then I do local color correction as well. This is where we're going in and just adding some local values to certain areas. Like we're going in and just brightening up the eyes, going in and just darkening up certain areas. Like I want to, I want to have more focus in this area. And uh, that really just helps me to bring certain things down. Like this, these areas here are way too hot. So we just bring them down and then just tiny bit of color, just hand painting color, making his cheeks a little bit redder. Then we're using like a fake ambient inclusion pass. I'm just painting in black in certain areas and then just putting the soft light and just getting in here, just to add a bit more contrast. And then a tiny bit of brightness contrast. This is kind of texture painting. We should have kind of done this in texture painting. You see the horns are just getting a bit um, a bit brighter and tip, which looks quite nice. And this is something you can of course do in post, but obviously, try to do as much as this in uh, texture as you can. But you know, once everything is done, the render is properly done, you're not gonna go in and go into Painter, export that to Blender, re-render this, you know, just do it in post. And then just a tiny bit of sharpness. Basically, I'm just merging everything together and using doing a high pass on it. And then uh, just setting this overlay. I'm not even sure if you can see any difference here. And then we have the final thing where we're just doing a little bit of like chromatic aberration on top of the whole thing and a little bit of noise, a little film grain on it. And then we're just going over and just balancing this a little bit, just pushing it to become a little bit brighter. And that's it for uh, for this. This is a uh, <laughs> nice like, what, 45, 50 minute video <laughs> on uh, doing this, which does take this this uh, unedited took around uh, like doing the whole thing in the course took around 24 hours so this does take quite a lot of time to do uh, so yeah i hope you enjoyed um, this video i hope this was really helpful for you and you can really see how the steps are interconnected uh, we would love to see your tips as well in the comments and if you are interested in learning how to make this guy from scratch like no time lapses no no cuts no anything just nicely nice work properly paced, then I highly recommend our new masterclass where you learn this called Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass, where we go through all this in 21 hours of, um, of real-time proper videos.